Good morning and welcome to Lincoln Heights Christian Church. My name is Chris Rusin. I the privilege of being lead pastor around here. I'm excited about today. I'm excited about, really I'm excited about not only today, but next Sunday. Just so you know, again, Jason just said it. But it's Sunday fun day, or as I say it, it's Sunday fun day. I mean, it's going to be awesome, all right. So, uh, and, and, and I, I, I mean, Super Bowl stuff's fun. I love that. Whether you love football or not, it's fine. But we are going to have some football-themed stuff next week. Um, not football theme stuff, Kona Ice. That's be free for everybody to be fun. Uh, we got some a big giant slides for the kids. It'd be a lot of fun too. They won't be water slides, they'll be normal slides. And then inside, we're also gonna be, um, inside the main auditorium is we're gonna be raffling off two authentic NFL jerseys. We're gonna have the Kansas City Chiefs one and the Philadelphia Eagles. And we're gonna be just, just doing a drawing to give them away, one at each service. And then for all the rest of us, okay, just if you want to have fun and join the fun, just wear your favorite team jersey. I don't care if it's football, badminton, lacrosse, whatever it is. Okay, just wear your favorite jersey next week. We're going to have some fun and just hang out. But here's the whole purpose of it. We want to prime the pump, okay. And what I mean by that is, is similar to the fall. I told you about a one, two, three strategy. Remember that? The one, two, three strategy was Thanksgiving Eve service then Christmas services, and then also it was baptism Sunday in January. So here's the one, two, three strategy for the spring that I want to encourage you to be praying about, okay? Number one is Sunday fun day to get you excited about inviting your family, friends, and neighbors to come join you, okay? The next one's going to be our community kickball event on March 5th. It's insane. It happens at a local park down here. It's one of the best things we do. It, it's like hundreds of people come out and we just play kickball for like a couple hours. But it's like a, kind of like a park day. It's a lot of fun. And it's designed for you to invite your friends to come to that too. And then the th number three of the strategy is Easter. That you would invite your friends to join you on Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday is going to be insane. It's going to be so encouraging. And I don't want you, you or your friends to miss it. So uh, be thinking about that. And before we go any further, let's just uh, stop and pray. Um, I do want to say this too. I do realize that all of you being here today is a big deal. Thank you. All of us are going through stuff. Um, you know, just the stupid stuff every week. You know, like this week for me, I found out my dog uh, got cancer. I'm going to have to put her down. So that really sucks. Uh, so it's been kind of like, you know, beating me up a little bit. But it made me, re you know, remember that all of us have stuff. You got stuff. I get, I get that. And I want you to know that God cares about your stuff. He sees you and he loves you. And, he, and he's here. All right. So let's just pray and ask God to just to really remind us how real he is. Let's pray. God, we love you. Lord, thank you for being someone who just cares. Thank you for seeing our stuff. Thank you for walking with us through it. And I ask in the name of Jesus that you please would just, just hold the people in the room, those online, all the stuff they're going through. And please encourage them right now. Help them to see and know and believe that you, you love them and you're with them. Please be here today, God. We need you. Please speak through me. May people see you, not see me. God, may they hear you and not hear me. But may you have your way here today. In your name we pray. Amen. We are in the middle of this sermon series that we're calling uh, When Then. It's written by a friend of a friend of mine named Rusty George. And this book we gave out free at Christmas services. I want to encourage you to pick one up still. There's a few left. And, and really, there's, it's really designed to help you understand God's promises and really just lean into them in 2023. So there's a different promise every week we process and different when-then statement, and we're going to get to that today. Let me go ahead and start with this little question here. What would you say is the subject that Jesus spends the majority of his time talking about in the Gospels? Now, don't say it out loud because I don't want to embarrass you, okay? And you, might, you might say something like, it's love, you know, or it's peace, or it's forgiveness, or it's money, or it's like evil, or sin, or whatever it is, okay? But really what it is... And you see it highlighted in every parable that he talks about. And a parable, is, again, is, a, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The answer is this, the kingdom of God. It is the number one subject that Jesus talks about the most with his, with his disciples, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, people he's engaging with. He's trying to help them understand this idea, this amazing truth of the kingdom of God also referred to sometimes as the kingdom of heaven. Now, right now you're going, Chris, I really don't get that or understand what that is. We're going to process that together a little bit today. Uh, but I will say this, that Gordon Fee is a New Testament scholar, and he made this quote, I thought was just, it resonated with me, and it's heavy. You cannot know anything about Jesus if you miss the kingdom of God. 
I'm sorry to say it that strongly, but this is the great failure of evangelical Christianity. What? I agree. It, it's that important. Because what happens if you try to uh, detach Jesus from the kingdom of God, then Jesus becomes your little lowercase g. Manipulate. The, the kingdom of God is essential of understanding who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. The kingdom of God was the main topic of Jesus throughout the Gospels. He wants us to understand it. So how would you define the kingdom of God today? I mean, if it's this important, you've never heard this before. If you read the Gospels, you'll see what I'm talking about. It, it, it comes up all time. But how come we don't know what it is? I, you might think if you were to define it to maybe a, um, someone who asked, you might go, well, it's kind of like it, it's, the, it's the church. Or you might say it's like uh, God's people. Or maybe it's like the kingdom of heaven. It's someday. You know, we're going to get there someday. You might uh, envision like, you know, uh, the kingdom of God. Envision, you, know, you think of like castles, right? That's a big castle in the sky with like a couple of Christian flags waving back and forth or something like that. It's like, friends, I'll tell you right now, that's not the kingdom of God. It's not it. And if you are tempted to think about it being a place, either somewhere, someday, it's not a place. It's, it's, it's way not, it's less about a place and way more about the power of God working in and through people. This is the kingdom of God. It's about his authority, his strength, his power, what he has done what he will do and what he is doing currently in this moment. This is the kingdom of God. And, and if you go, well, Chris, give me a little bit of like, you know, give, give me some reference. Well, right off the bat, Mark, being the first gospel, not in order that we see in the Bible, but written historically, Mark pens this gospel, quotes Jesus, and Jesus says, the right time is now here. God's kingdom is very near. Your hearts and lives, it says change your hearts and lives and believe in the good news. Change your hearts and lives and believe in the good news. Besides those two words, change and believe, or I'll, I'll swap them in a moment, believe and change. This is Jesus mentioning the kingdom in terms of like it's here, but it's very near. Like, well, where is it? Like, when is it? I will say this, that the kingdom is, it's really, it's be difficult to, to, to really grasp if you look at it from a linear perspective. But if you want to go linear, the kingdom of God began on earth the moment Jesus stepped foot on it. The moment that God in the flesh really just revealed himself to us. Then we could see the kingdom in that moment. And, and then also, too, the kingdom is both now and not yet. It's still coming in all of its fullness someday, later. It's something less linear and more mystical more uh, spherical, it's all happening at the same time. But the key values of the kingdom is that you would believe the good news and be changed by it. That is key. Those words are key to believe the good news that God loves you with an unconditional love. You believe that and it rocks you to the core, it changes you and leads you to change the world around you not just on the mission field in Kenya or Mexico, but in your workplace, in your home, in your marriage, in relationship with your kids, your neighbors, and everyone around you. That's what the kingdom is. Now, if you want a definition, here's the definition that I use to work with, and maybe it'll help you. The kingdom of God is defined as wherever Jesus is and whenever his church chooses to believe and change, there is the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? It's, where, it's wherever G Jesus shows up, voila, the kingdom's there, okay? And then wherever his church, his church being the hands and feet of Jesus. You've heard that. We are called the body of Christ in the Bible. We are that, that current modern day representation of who Jesus is, which I feel like, gosh, you think he would come up with a better, a better group of people <laughs> to represent him because sometimes we're so stupid, you know. But he picks us. Go out and we represent him. We show people his incredible love. Demonstrate the power that he talks about here in our lives. That people see a change in us because we believed. And we continue to believe. 
and we keep allowing him to bring the change. See, the daily question for if you're a Christian is, is going to be this. Every day, will you decide to believe the good news and make a change for the kingdom or not? This is the daily qu question for every Christian for every day of our lives. It'll never change. Will you believe today in the good news that he loves you with an unconditional love? And will you allow that to change something in you? and result in a change for the kingdom or not. Meet Brandon and Faith Lee and their little bundle of joy. Uh, they, uh, Brandon and Faith Lee live in Hell's Kitchen, New York. They love their neighborhood, they love coffee, and they really love Jesus. They had a dream to start a coffee shop uh, a few years back, and it was, they wanted to, um, that would serve as a place of refreshment for people and restoration for people. They watched the planet, uh, just what's going on in their culture, just suffer. And, and the people around their neighbors suffer. They said, you know what? They wanted the planet, their employees, and all those who were part of the supply chain from producer to customer to be better off because of their business idea. So after a lot of hard work and seeking some key investors, they opened Bird and Branch Coffee in Hell's Kitchen a few years back. And I will say this, guys, it's flourishing still. It made it through the hell that was COVID. That, that was the hell on small, small businesses especially. I mean, it, it, they made through it. They made it through. And they're making a difference. And they're a light in this neighborhood. And, and Brandon and Faith, they quit their jobs to ensure that those who lacked living wages and job training could have a shot at a th really thriving in a society that says that they're unworthy because they once lived on the street or committed crimes, or were sexually exploited. Brandon and Faith said, we want to really hire these type of people who've been through the ringer to show these people and the world of God's power, how he can redeem, how he can heal, how he is the one who brings value to us, not anything else in our culture. Brandon and Faith's parents did not come to America with the plan that their children would create jobs for the formerly homeless and or incarcerated. That is not America's invitation. And it's certainly not the narrative for college-educated ed Chinese Americans living in New York City. But that is just one of the possibilities when two people fall in love with Jesus and choose the vision of the kingdom of God over the vision offered to us by the United States of America. You see, we get so tempted into believing that it's all about us, our pursuit of liberty, of happiness, of peace. It's all about us, you know, building our stuff and us getting the chances that we need and, and really helping our, our kingdoms grow. And, and, and God flips it around and, oh, he's up to something bigger. His kingdom is something bigger. He wants to use you and I uh, as individuals, as a church, to, to make a difference. In a bigger way than just being comfortable and something that falls within our own just paradigm or context. He has a bigger one. You see, hope has come to hell's kitchen because two people decided to believe the good news and make a change for the kingdom. That's it. It's two people decided to believe that Jesus changes everything. That he can, that he has, that he is changing everything, that this unconditional love makes a difference in our lives. And when we believe this, it leads to a change, not just of hearts, not just of habits, but a change that works its way into the fabric of society and changes neighborhoods, cultures, countries, the world. See, they believed the kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is. And whenever his church chooses to believe and change, there is the kingdom of God. Here's one, another, just another example of Jesus talking about the kingdom of God. And it's the one I want to reference uh, most often today. And, and he says this, this is Jesus speaking. He says, the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field. One day, a man found the treasure. He hid it again and was so happy, the so happy is code for he believed. 
that he went and sold everything he owned, code for he changed, and bought the field. Pause. Chris, what's, up, what's, what's next? <laughs> That's it. Jesus moves on to the next parable, the next thought. But it's all still the same subject, the kingdom of God. This one small little parable, he's dropping multiple truth bombs on us. Let's just process this for a second. Again, he says the kingdom of God is like a what? Come on now. A treasure, okay. Now say the whole phrase, it's a treasure buried in a field. One more time. The kingdom of God is like a what? A treasure buried in a field, okay. So he says it's a treasure. And that's really first and foremost, it's a treasure. And it's buried in this field, and this, this guy, he stumbles upon it, sees it, and he just freaks out like, what? A treasure, right? And he goes and, and he's, he sells everything he has, buys the field, you know, and, and it just ends right there. I'll get to that. I'll get to more of that in a moment. But treasure hunting, have you ever done it? Have you ever seen anybody do it? Okay, have you ever watched this TV show on Discovery, Mystery at Blind Frog Ranch? Which when you watch it, it's like this. Mystery at Blind Frog Ranch. I mean, it's creepy, right? It is creepy. And, and, and the premise is this. Th this guy named Dwayne, he's like an experienced driller. He, he loves, like, you know, he, he knows how to drill all over the world. But he, he got word of this treasure in Utah. Yeah, Utah. It, it's in this rando desert. And uh, it's right next to some rando pieces of uh, property. One place called a Skinwalker Ranch. Ooh, okay. It's next to that. Uh, he buys the property. Brings all of this, this geological equipment and scientists and whatnot. Starts making maps of the underground system down there. Ends up, long story short, finding a treasure, Aztecian gold. Gold. So here's where we're at. I, I, I'm, I'm on season two right now. Okay, so season two, basically they set this whole thing up. And it's like they can only work during like the good months. But they, you know, they basically have found where it's at, and mapped it with a, with a computer, dug a big hole down there. Now they're going to they drop themselves in. They're exploring this cave system beneath to access the treasure and pull it out. And that ended like, you know, season two ended on that. But this is what drives me crazy. It's interesting about Dwayne. Dwayne is all, he's this cool guy. He's got like an Indiana Jones hat. And he's just like, yeah, I'm Dwayne. I'm just all about the treasure. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm here to help out. But I, I want you to know I care about my family. I care about my family. I love my family. Well, the number one guy on his team is his son. His son's even cooler than him. Now, his son, it's interesting. His son's got wife, kids, but if there's anything dangerous to do, he's, Dwayne's always like, my boy will go in there first. What? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, send the boy in. He'll, he'll go take care of it. It's like, what? I mean, wife, kids, and, and this guy's being dropped down into like, Areas where you have to scuba tank in, it's underwater, his air is like, you know, running out. You know, another area time he's dropped into a poisonous gas area where he's walking with this big old radiation suit because he's worried about like, you know, radiation. And I'm like, this guy is putting his son in harm's way for the treasure. It's all about the treasure. And, and you see it every episode. The, the like, it's like insanity. You're so obsessed with it. It's nothing else matters. It's all the treasure. That is what Jesus, and again, it sounds crazy to say it with Dwayne, but that's what Jesus wants us to think about the kingdom. We're that obsessed with it. Back to the parable. In, in Jewish culture, if someone was walking along in a field and they saw a treasure, and you go, Chris, that would never happen. It actually happened often and during this time of history. Why did it happen often in this time of history? Because people were getting ransacked all the time. I mean, there were empires coming in, empires going out, and the best place to put your money was not in a bank. It was where? In the ground. And just bury it. And that's what they did. In order to, they're trying to evade some sort of incoming empire, right? So you find stuff. It would happen after like a storm or whatever. And, and here this guy finds something in this parable story, and he's like, this is amazing. Now, Jewish culture... Right? It had a way of dealing with you finding a treasure. It was really simple. I love how they did this law. It's simply this. Get ready. Finders, keepers. That's all it was. Okay? So if you found it, it was yours. Now you go, Chris, what about the Roman? Yeah, Roman law was big stuff during this time. They dealt with the bigger matters. This stuff they didn't care about as much. They would go ahead and submit to kind of Jewish law. And Jewish law was finders, keepers. So he finds the treasure. He doesn't need to do anything. It's his. But because he's so infatuated with the treasure, what does he do? He goes and sells everything he has in order to buy the what? The field, the land. In order to double make sure that no one takes this away from him. 
this is going to be his main focus. And, and also, too, to make sure he doesn't go back to the boats or the shipping industry, whatever he was doing. That he's not going back. This is where he's at now. He is 100% invested into giving himself to this treasure. This is what Jesus uses in a short paragraph to under, help us understand the kingdom. Again, the kingdom of God is like a treasure. Hidden in the field, one day a man found the treasure. He hid it again and was so happy, code for he believed, that he went and sold everything he owned, code for he changed and bought the field. Friends, have you bought the field? Have you bought the field because you value the kingdom? And if you have bought the field, are you investing into it? We tell ourselves, you know, well, I, it's a good field. I mean, it's a good treasure. Yeah, Jesus loves me. I love it. I, I love, I could, you know, I bury it and sometimes I come back and visit it again, you know, like once a week and see the treasure and it's like, oh, I feel good about it, shiny. And I kind of grab off some dirt on it and be like, I got this treasure and then I leave. But I'm not doing much about it. I'm, I'm not trying to sell it all in order to really focus on it. I'm not trying to give my attention to it. I got my own things to do. I got my own shipping yard going on over here. I got my things to do. The idea of, buying the field and being totally sold out for the kingdom is something I think that we struggle with. And we struggle then after that investing into it. We don't really believe its value or has value. So therefore we don't change. See, it's difficult to invest into God's kingdom when we're so heavily invested into building our own. So heavily invested. We have so many responsibilities, mouths to feed, things to do. Adventures to go on. And, and, and we, we, these things, they can become distractions. They can be. And, and these kingdoms, the kingdom of me, like what would our kingdoms look like? This is the kingdom of me. The kingdom of me includes our mental and physical health, our friends and family, our jobs and careers, our hobbies and dreams, our money and our stuff. This, my friends, is the kingdom of me. Now here comes the zinger you're probably not going to be ready for. But when it comes to God caring about your kingdom, he absolutely does. He does. You know, Chris, you're supposed to say he hates my kingdom and I'm a loser. Nope. Again, this unconditional love is powerful. He loves you. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll help encourage you with this process of how he cares about your kingdom. He's given you passions, friend. He's given you interests. He's, he's given you giftings. And why would he give you these things if it was just, just, just kind of sit on a shelf? He, he wants you to, 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 to use them. He cares about your health, your mental health. He cares about your family and friends. These are all things part of our kingdom. He cares about our kingdom. He does. He really does. And he's giving us ingredients daily in order to help us with our kingdoms. He's investing into our kingdoms on a regular basis. Have you ever heard or seen the show Nailed It on Netflix? Okay. Uh, and nailed, nailed It on Netflix, it's basically one of those baking shows where regular people like you and me uh, compete to win $10,000 if they nail it. Now, in each episode, there's three contestants, just random baker, you know, just, you know, Home chef smosh, okay? No, no professionals, just like me and you, okay? And three contestants complete for $10,000, and they're given a couple things. They're given all the ingredients, all the tools in order to make the cake, and they're given a template. These are examples of templates, okay? And they get like one per episode. This, uh, these are two, so there'd be two episodes. These are designed by uh, uh, just really master craft, you know, people who know what they're doing when it comes to cakes. And... They say, okay, here's the template, here's all the stuff, let's see what you can do. And right, right away, the blue one looks complicated, right? And the yellow one's like, come on, it's an emoji, no big deal. Let's see what they do with the blue one, all right? This is the person who won right there, okay? So they nailed it. I, I guess they nailed it, you know, and, and they won. And you're like, that looks like the cookie monster trying to eat itself. You know, it's like horrible. Like, what is that? It's just like, it's, it's, it's so, so ugly, but I guess they nailed it, you know? And then the next one, the yellow one, that would be easier. I mean, they, they can't screw that one up, right? No, they screwed that one up big time. It looks like the bird from Charlie Brown and Snoopy, you know? It's like, you know, it's just, it's just so bad. 
It's an emoji. It's supposed to be round, you know. Nail this thing. And they can't. They just don't. They don't know how to, the, the freezing process with the frosting and, uh, and all the techniques. They, they just don't know. You know, you can give them all the ingredients, all the tools, all the fancy cooking, baking equipment, but they don't know how. They just can't. This is the best they can get. And they, and they nailed it. Now, I think between me and you, um, I have a hard time really agreeing that they, uh, these contestants nailed it. Um, I bet there are times in your life, though, when you feel like these uh, <laughs> nailed it cakes. Where your kingdom looks a little bit like this. It's just like, gosh, I've been trying to build my kingdom for years. I've been trying to work on it. I'm trying to, I'm, 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 I'm going to school, I'm training, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to this, this, this work program, whatever it is. I'm trying to take this class. I'm trying to learn from people. I'm trying to build into my relationships. I'm trying to be healthy. I'm trying to work on my finances. Whatever your kingdom is. Again, the kingdom of me is wide. And you say, my kingdom, just, I'm not nailing it, Chris. And you're tempted to believe this. You tell yourself the reason why on your real low days that you didn't nail it is because God's mad at you, doesn't care about your kingdom. That he's upset. That he's out to get you. Stop. Believe the good news. The unconditional love that God has for you will never change. No matter how crappy your cake looks, he loves you still. And he has a plan for your life. And he wants to see your kingdom flourish. Chris, prove it. John 10.10 10 says, the, Jesus says, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give life. To give it fully. That you would love it. That you would excel. And your dreams would be just, it would be amazing. In James 1.17, I want you to catch this. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. That reminds me that every good and perfect thing comes from God. Every ingredient needed in order to build our cake slash kingdom comes from God. I believe that. I believe he's that much involved. He cares that much. You see, God cares about your cake slash kingdom. He's the one providing the ingredients that you need to bake it slash build it. And and he's providing those daily for you and I in our little kingdoms. The question is not, does God care about my kingdom? you got to get past that, friend. you got to get past that. The question really is, how is your kingdom advancing God's? How is it? And as much as God loves your kingdom, and a part of your kingdom, of course, is you, why would he ever? Position your kingdom in a, in, a, in, a, in a way where it's above and more important than his. That wouldn't help you or anyone else around you. And by the way, when it comes to competing with God's kingdom, his kingdom will always win. Always. It's that big. It's that powerful. Again, it's not about a place, but it's power. Always. So <laughs> this incredible, powerful kingdom of his, he wants you and I to recognize that and to have our lowercase k kingdoms be submissive to his and be intentional about advancing his kingdom. Now you hear this and you go, Chris, come on. I, I, I'm starting to feel uncomfortable with this, what you're saying here. I, I, don't, I don't get it. You know, it's a little fishy. It smells fishy. And I'm going to give you the main point today. And before I want, I held out this long to give it to you, the main point, because of how awkward this might be for you. But hear this. Here's the win-then statement. When you invest in God's kingdom, then God will invest in yours. This is the win-then promise. When you invest into God's kingdom, then God will invest into yours. Now, you go, Chris, come on. This sounds like, you know what it sounds like, Chris, you know, and I'll get to that in a moment. But I'm going to go ahead and prove it real quick with Matthew 6.33 when Jesus says, seek first the what? Kingdom of God. Above our kingdoms. And he says, and when we do, we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he'll take care of all the stuff in our kingdom. He says it straight up. 
but yet our lenses get in the way. And I talked about lenses a few weeks ago, remember? These lenses that we have when we see God. We all have a lens that we have. We have a lens that we've been given to uh, we, in our culture, in our family that we grew up with, uh, our current culture. We have a lens of how we see God, how we see the Bible. And this lens, I don't want you to think about good or bad, more healthy and unhealthy. And this lens impacts us. Many of us read this with a lens of, ah, health and wealth gospel. Prosperity gospel, Chris. Bad, you know, you know, whatever. It's like, no, stay away from that. I want you to know, I absolutely do, I do not like health and wealth gospel. I am not a prosperity gospel guy. I am absolutely against it, but this is not that. It's not. And it, it comes from, again, your lens. That you have three, if you, you say, Chris, I want a relationship with God. Great. There, I'm going to boil down to at least three types of relationships. There's transactional, there's unilateral, and then there's invitational. The transactional relationship is an if-then relationship. It says, if I do something, then God does something for me. It's very law-based, works-based, deals emphasis. You know, you pray those prayers, God, if you do this for me, God, then I'll do this for you. you know? If you just take care of this, God, then I'll come through. You know? God, if I do this, then you'll do this for me, right? That's the dance. If I give and drop a 20 in the plate, you're going to drop a 40 in mine, right? Yeah, that's how it works, right? Right? You know, that's how, using that lens for this subject. Then you have unilateral. Unilateral is usually a response to transactional. I don't like this. It's too legalistic and weird. And unilateral is, I'm all about the grace, baby. I'm all about the love. God loves me so much. I mean, I respond to that love that he has for me with a thank you, Jesus, and I'm just going to receive everything from you. It's by grace alone. You're doing all the work, and I do nothing. I just get loved. I just get encouraged. I just go through my life, build my kingdom, and expect you to bless it. And when you don't, I get mad at you. Because you're supposed to be the God of grace. This was not good either. Unhealthy. How about the third one? Invitational. Invitational, this lens views that God always makes the first step. You are being invited by God to remember and believe that he has an unconditional love for you. That he truly loves you. And it will never change. And when you have that unconditional love, grasp and understood to the best of your ability, you understand he's inviting you into a relationship. And when you see that invite, when you see that love, then God invites you to partner with him even more. It's when you respond to that love, then God does even more in your life and reveals more to you. It's not rocket science. It's actually very relational as you spend more time with him, as you would any person and get to know him and hang out with him. And he's, and he's interacting with you and you're interacting with him. It's invitational both ways, reciprocal, mutual. Then our relationship is formed and you were invited into something deeper than just going to church. Friend, when you invest in God's kingdom, then God will invest in yours. And you go, Chris, come on. Now, I don't see the difference between, you know, if then and when then. What's the difference? I, I, they sound real similar. And the difference between if then and when then is your motivation. Is it carrot or cared for? See, over here, transactional, it's carrot. You know, like put a carrot out, kind of bait somebody. And we're like, almost like, like we're being baited by God or we bait him with a carrot. Or... or is that you are cared for, and you know you're cared for with this unconditional love, and it moves you. It's an invitation that moves you to something deeper, something more alive. You know, the carrots, I, I, I love them, and they're great. And, and my wife makes an excellent little dip that we use carrots on all the time. It's great. Uh, and I, I love carrots. They're great. Uh, this idea of carrots got me thinking about, you know, what's the largest carrot out there? And this guy, he grew it, okay? So... Uh, this guy is Christopher Qualley of Minnesota. He grew a record-smashing carrot, 22.44 pounds. What? That's half a Backstreet Boy, okay? That's huge. That's an incredible carrot, okay? That's amazing. I mean, th this guy, this, I don't even know where the thing, it's amazing how he did this thing, right? So he, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records right now. And this guy who grew a huge carrot made me think about a Tim Keller story. Tim Keller pastor, author, the guy's a great a speaker too, and he told a story in his book called Prodigal God. And the, and the story goes like this, it's just made up, 
Once upon a time, there was a gardener who grew an enormous carrot. Ding, 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 ding. Um, he took it to his king and said, my lord, this is the greatest carrot I've ever grown and ever will grow. And the king is like, obviously. <laughs> Therefore, I want to present it to you, my king, as a token of my love and respect for you. The king was touched and discerned the man's heart. So uh, as the gardener was turning to go out of, the, court, uh, of the, the king's court, the king said, hey, wait, you are clearly a good steward of this earth. I, I own a, a plot of land actually right next to yours. And I want to give it to you freely as a gift. So you can garden it as well. The gardener was amazed. He's like, what? Just delighted, you know. And went home just rejoicing. But there was a nobleman at the king's court who overheard all of this. And he said to himself, my, if that's what you get for a carrot, what would the king give if I gave something better? So the next day the nobleman came before the king and he was leading a handsome black stallion. He bowed low. He taught the horse to bow as well, you know. It was a beautiful little moment. And he says, my Lord, I, I breed horses, and this is the greatest horse I've ever bred or ever will. Therefore, I want to present it to you as a token of my love and respect for you. The king discerned his heart and said, thank you, and took the horse and merely dismissed him. The nobleman was perplexed, like, why am I being this dismissed right now? And the king saw he needed some help understanding it. So the king said, let me explain. That gardener was giving me the carrot, but you were giving yourself the horse. How often do we take this to God? The same mentality. We, we say, God, look what I'm giving to you, right? You, you're going to give it to me, right? You're going give to me, give me something good. Because God, that, my motivation is that, there's a carrot system here, God, right? I've been taught all my life in this religious church thing that if I do this, you're going to do this. Come on now. Friend, you're looking through a lens of transactional, a transactional relationship. And, and then you, and you've been burned by this, right? Because it doesn't work, so you, you settle for just nothing. You don't give it all. It's all about the grace. But what about the invitation? What about the invitation knowing that you're cared for. How will that change you? See, when you believe the good news, when you believe the treasure is a treasure, you, you are more than happy to sell it all and, and to believe this is a treasure that changes you and it changes not only you, but outside of you and worlds around you. When you invest in God's kingdom, then God will invest in yours. So how do I invest in God's kingdom? I don't have a lot of time to process all this with you, so I'm going to give you a quick overview, and uh, I'm going to have some fun with this, okay? And the question, how do I invest in God's king kingdom? I think the answer is this, that God's kingdom investors are pig investors. Chris, you mean big investors, right? No, I mean pig. Because I love acrostics, and they, they make me laugh, okay? I love them, okay? So you need to be a pig investor. And, and you know, Chris, uh, what's a pig investor? Well, God's in kingdom investors, they, they invest prayerfully, uh, intentionally, and they're they invest genero generously as well. Pig. And you go, Chris, where do you get pig from? Well, this was me uh, two weeks ago on my birthday. I went to a breakfast with my wife. We actually rode our bikes there. And we pull up this outside little venue, and there's a pig attached to a table. And the waitress is like, I have no idea who this is. I have no, it's not mine. I don't know. And I was like, okay, interesting. She has no idea how it got there. That's weird, right? And, I, and she's like, yeah, I think the guy's inside, but I don't know. And I, just kind of, I made a quick little joke. I'm like, you know, I've always loved the restaurant for how fresh your ingredients are. And I said, you're proving it right here. In fact, I want some bacon, you know. <laughs> she, she's <laughs> you know, I thought I was funny. But anyway, so anyways, the, the pig thing is actually on my heart right now. I've just seen one recently, and it's crazy. But God wants us to be pig investors. And the first part of pig is P, that we invest prayerfully. Invest into his kingdom prayerfully. How many of you are just at a point in your, in your generosity or giving, you're just kind of throwing stuff out, if you throw anything out at all. And you're not really processing you know, what's going on with this? And you're not allowing this, this, this incredible resource God's given you to actually be a tool to build relationship with him. Let me say it again. Money, I believe, is a tool that God gives us to, to build relationships with him and with others. Not that we buy his love. 
but it's a tool for us to sit down together with him and go, God, I don't know what you want me to do with this. And all of a sudden what happens is in the midst of the discussion over money, you are building a what with him? Relationship. So prayerfully saying, God, I need your help with this. And this is the prayer I love in the Bible. If you are someone struggling with money, uh, adopt Psalms 119.36. Um, help me, Lord, to prefer obedience to making money. This is the prayer. <laughs> I just, I love the simplicity of it. And it's so authentic, right? It's like, this is the issue. This is where we go, I found the treasure, yay! Just bury it back up again. Bye-bye. No, <laughs> I'll just, I'll visit it on like, you know, whenever I want. It's, it's, it's not fully accepted. Because if, if the treasure was of value to you, you'd be like, this has changed my life. This has changed my life. This is a love that no one else has given me. Oh, and by the way, it's not a love that came into my life one time. It's a, it's a love that comes into my life every stinking day. It gives me hope, clarity, wisdom, peace. This love means something to me. It's valuable. And because it's valuable, it leads to a change and change in me, not just in my heart, not just in how I feel, but in my actions. And what it ultimately will lead me to do is come to a point of saying, do I trust God enough to obey him? Oh, God, please help me prefer obedience to making money. Please help me, God. Pray. Kingdom of God investors, pray. Number two, when you invest into his kingdom, invest into his kingdom intentionally. Intentionally. This will help you, especially if you are, remember, there's transactional, unilateral, and invitational. If you're stuck in the unilateral, it's all about the love. This will help you. Okay. Invest into his kingdom intentionally. And, and, and when I thought about this, this stat hit me this week. I wanted to just give it to you. And we'll get more into this later on some other day. But this is the percentage of income Christians give to a church. This is crazy. It's not crazy for me. I see it all the time. <laughs> 10% give more than 8% of their income. Now, just so we're clear, we don't, we don't track people's W-2s, you know. Uh, or it's, it's really just kind of like, you know, some churches do that, which is nuts. I, the Mormon church does that, which is crazy. I mean, it's a great business, you know, but this isn't a business. And, and this, is, this is something that's it's, it's deeper. But it, what they found through surveys is 10% give more than 8% of the income. That's pretty good. You might go, Chris, 1 out of 10, that's pretty darn good if Christian's carrying the weight. <laughs> I, I would be like, okay, take that idea and play it to football next Sunday. Could you imagine if 1 out of the 11 came out healthy on the field, the other 10 guys had like boots on, like big old casts, you know, uh, blue 42, hike, and the quarterback's running around. He can't do much. Because the rest of the team are, are just so held back by this boot or multiple boots. 23% give between 2 and 8% of their income. Hey, Chris, that's pretty good. I mean, they're giving between 2% and 8%. That means they're kind of on a journey. Okay, let's say that. Let's combine the first two stats. That means one-third of the Christian church in America are actually in the game. One-third. Again, watch football next Sunday. That means about... What, three or four guys are playing? <laughs> Expect them to do anything significant with three or four. When every NFL team has 11 on the field from each team. Go to the next one. 42% give less than 2% of their income. This is the highest percent. 42%, the majority here, okay, I, I, not the majority, but the highest percent, give less than 2%. That's the equivalent of throwing in a 20 or maybe throwing in a hundred every once in a while when you're really feeling bad. Then the last one, 26% give nothing of their income. Over one quarter of Bible-believing Christians who say, oh, I value this, don't give anything. You add those bottom two together, what do you get? Two-thirds of the Christian church don't give. Jack diddly. <laughs> and then you go, but Chris, they're giving their time. I give my time. I'm all about my time. And friend, I, I'm all about the, the classic giving talk. You know, you got to give your time, your talents, and your treasure. And it's like, awesome, yeah, time. And, and, and this culture right now, more so than previous cultures, are really into their time right now. 
and giving their time. And it's like, wow, that's awesome. And here's a little bit of a, of a backwards uh, mentality, I think of it. We think of time, I think we should, if you compare time to money, time is more precious, right? I mean, really, you can't ever get it back. Money, you can. But yet this culture says, I'm going to give my time. I think it's not because of how precious my time is. I think it's because of how precious my gold is. I'm not giving that up. I'll give my time and maybe some of my talents, but I'm not giving my treasure because my treasure is what's going to keep me going. This is where my security is at. This is where my encouragement's at. These are my parameters. I'll give you my time every once in a while, a little bit of my talents maybe, but you ain't getting my treasure because it's part of my kingdom building. And when we do that to God, when we said we're just not going to do it, you know, I believe God in all of his love that we believe in goes, I love you. I know. I know you're scared. I know you don't fully trust. I know. It doesn't change the way that I love you. But I'm not going to settle for a unilateral relationship with you. I'm not. I'm going to keep inviting you and inviting you and inviting you and inviting you and inviting you to come into a deeper relationship with me because he knows guys that our kingdom building will never give us what our souls want as much as he loves you and our kingdom he has something better for you and for the world so he'll never stop inviting you maybe you'll see it today make your motivation be that he cares for you not some carrot see the third part is that god's kingdom investors invest in his kingdom generously you know, uh, you can go back to percentages. And the reason why percentages are important, because you go, Chris, why do I have to do that? It's like percentages help you with the emotion. So you're not, you're not making decisions off emotion. Like, well, was it a good sermon today? Then I'll go ahead and tip it. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, it wasn't that good. It's too long. I'm out. I'm not giving. Guys, and you go, 10%, Chris, that's Old Testament. <laughs> Old Testament is really like 25% based on all the all offerings. New Testament, Chris, I'm all about New Testament. New, New Testament, you think it's 0%? It's 100%. 100%. It's all his. Everything, every good and perfect gift comes from him. Guys, check this out generously. 2 Corinthians, remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. Boom. Mic drop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over, make up your own mind, what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. This is a great verse. It, it removes it from like law and 10% and legality and like, okay, so what's the actual percent? What's it going to be? It's just simply be a cheerful giver. And you guys know that every week when I say, hey, church, it's time to give. Yeah, yeah right? It comes from this verse. I'm trying to prime the pump in your soul that you would understand. It's something that we get to be a part of, not something we have to do. I'll end it with this. Here's something personal in my life. You want to know about Pastor Chris. A few people know this. Hannah knows this. I love dessert and french fries. If we ever go out to dinner, me and you, and the waitress or waiter comes up and says, would you like dessert? The answer, I'm going to look at you politely and be like, mm. in my head it's always, hell yeah, I want dessert, okay? Every time. Okay, and if you say something like back to me in order to save money, and like, hey, why don't, why don't we split one? I'll be like, mm -hmm, sure. In my mind, I'm already negotiating my tactics how I'm going to do this. And what I do is this dessert comes, if there's only one dessert, I'll ask you questions. Well, tell me about what's going on. And I'll, like, mm. I'll just mow it down while you're talking about your life, blah, blah, blah. I'm getting my dessert, okay? I love it that much. <laughs> and then fries are the same way. If you ever, it's the same thing. You order like, oh, appetizer, plate of fries. Oh, they're going to be gone, okay? Because I love them so much. Now, with that in mind, this story has happened multiple times with me and my, me and my child. I have, I have four girls, four kids. They're all amazing. This has happened multiple times, whether it be McDonald's, in and out blah, 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 whatever, okay? If there's ever a time where I take them out and we have a little meal like this. And I, I imagine we're, we stand in the line, we've already bought it, sit down with it, fries and, some, and, a, and a frosty. And I've seen this happen. We're all of a sudden, when, when they're little, you know, one of my little ones would be like, thanks, Dad. Hmm. Bring it right to her, right? And I'm like, well, what, what, what are we doing? What are we doing here? <laughs> well, these are mine. These are mine. Thank you, Dad. And just starts dipping them in the frosties. And I'm like, 
No, that's we're sharing this. That we're using this as a way to connect. No, it's mine. Thank you. Go get your own. You know, <laughs> no, I miss it. missing the point, right? And and I'm like, okay. And then she's like, well, why, why don't we try sharing? Then maybe, okay, they'll dump them out, right? And when they dump them out, they do the same thing. Thanks, Dad. And leave me like three. I'm like, here you go. And I'm like, they don't understand, okay, where it just came from. Like just minutes ago, we were in line, and I bust out the cash to, to bust out and pay for those fries and the frosty. And, and they don't understand that I have the ability to go back there and whip out my Costco beans, and I can clean the whole Wendy's out, okay, get all the French fries and frosties I want if I wanted to because I have those type of resources. And they don't get it. They think, no, 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 this is mine, this is all I'm going to get, and you don't get any. Friends, this is us with God way too often. We don't understand the money is like shake and fries. It's meant to build a, a relational tool. We don't understand he has the authority under the kingdom of God, the power to just make it rain frosty and, 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 and French fries. Make it rain. But we don't, we don't think about that. We say, oh, I believe in the power of Jesus Christ. The power of his love, his love so much. The grace, woo, no, but it comes to my giving, hell no, God. Draw the line. I don't believe you can give me more than what I've brought in myself. And to top it off, I'm in so much debt. I need to just, you know, pay off my debt first, and pay my bills, feed all these mouths I have in my life, and i got to take care of these responsibilities. I can't take care of you, God. You take care of you. And God's like, I don't need the money. I make the money. I don't need it. This isn't about me, okay? This is only about me and that I want you to obey me because I want to help you. Your heart is calloused. You are worshiping a false god and you don't even know it. I mean, guys, there's stats I read this week about greed. And every American, every, every survey, greed would be the number one issue in America. Oh, Americans are so greedy. So greedy. And now, are you greedy? Oh, no, I'm not. Not at all. <laughs> Like, we're not greedy. It's the biggest problem in America, but we're not greedy individually. No, I'm a giver. Right. God's kingdom investors are pig investors. They invest prayerfully, intentionally, with percentages, not emotion, and generously. Because, friend, if you could never, if you please remember this, I love this phrase, you'll never be able to outgive God. You'll never outgive them. So start being a pig investor today, in God's kingdom today. And when you invest in God's kingdom, and, and guys, I'm telling you, this is something that it's taken a while for me, me to learn too, my journey. But Hannah and I, we, we give, when we hear about the local storehouse in the Old Testament, where they would bring their tithes and offerings to the local storehouse or the local synagogue, today's version of that is the local church. So we give 10% to our local church, and then we give above and beyond that outside this place. And you go, Chris, why do you even give here? You work here. Yeah, I know. But I don't see it as that, as a business thing. I see it as an obedience thing. We give because he asks us to give, and I believe it's good for our hearts when we do so. So we invest in the local church, and in this part of the kingdom, in this area, we do that. And then we give on top of that. We give to Kenya. We, we, give, we give to, there's somewhere in, in North, North Arizona we give to. We give, we, we give to other places outside the state and the country often. Friend, you could do that. Give to your local, local storehouse. Give outside of it as well. When you invest in a God's kingdom, then God will invest in yours. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? If you believe the treasure of the treasure, it will lead to change. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, we need you. And Father, forgive us for just holding on to our stuff, holding on to our fries and, and frosties and, and, and just claiming them to be ours. Forgive us for, for forgetting that every good and perfect ingredient comes from you. Thank you that you care about our cakes, that you actually want to see them grow. Thank you, God. But God, help us to today to start submitting our kingdoms to yours and wanting to see your kingdom grow in the lives of people. Father, forgive us and thank you for loving us.
And may love, may your love be the, the motivation we have today, not a carrot of any sort. In your name that we pray, amen. In this moment, we have communion, and, and usually it, it's, it is what it is. You know, Jesus says, I want you to take this little, these little elements, and you're going to get, in a moment, a chance to go back and get them. Uh, they're by the giving boxes. But it's a wafer symbolic of his body broken and juice symbolic of his, his blood shed. And we're stop and remember his sacrifice. The, the temptation is to swig it and move on. But if your heart is struggling with greed, if your heart is struggling with not seeing the kingdom as a treasure, that today, take it differently. Understand that you need to move from a carrot in front of you to understanding that you're cared for. Let today during communion remind you that you are cared for. He loves you. And this unconditional love forgives sin and it changes the direction of a person's life. Let it change yours today. Tap into that love, maybe for the first time or do it again during this time of communion. Thank him for his sacrifice. And you're invited to go get your, uh, your, your, your little communion packets right now. And if you want to get baptized, we actually have a special baptism happening today. But if you also want to be part of it, make your way to that I Want Jesus uh, sign. And if you need some prayer, we'll have people in the corners to pray for you. You're invited to go get your communion.